Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, continuation of the uh, talk on abandoned churches. Uh, I mentioned at the end of last time, but I'd actually forgotten to put one on. And this is the one out at uh, Levisham, uh, because I was doing them all in North Yorkshire. Levisham is uh, close to Pickering. In fact, they have the railway station on the uh, North York Moors Railway, uh, but it's quite hard to get to. Uh, so this is you get out on the road from Pickering to Whitby. Uh, there's a signpost down to Lockton and Levisham. You go down there, go through Lockton, and it drops down a valley side, crosses a bridge by a former mill, and then climbs up the other side to the village of Levisham, which is at the top of the hill. But it wasn't always so. Halfway up the hill to the left-hand side is a farm track that goes down. I think you can just squeeze your car in at the top of that track because you can't go down because it will take your exhaust off unless you've got a very large four by four. And even that, when you get down to the bottom, the uh, lane narrows down again and goes into a field. A footpath goes down the side of the church here and it's about a five minute walk. I must say it's a five minute walk down. It's a 10 minute walk back because it's so steep, this road. Uh, and this around here was the former village of Levisham. And it's probably thought around about uh, 1349 during the Black Death uh, is that it was moved from here up the hill because there's this river walk down here, the uh, Levisham Beck, uh, which is thought to have maybe uh, have been the source of the uh, Black Death but, or cholera or whatever it is they might have had there around at that time because no one really knows. And so they went up the hill and then they later built a church up there at the end of the village. You go through the village and it sort of goes across the moor top, then drops down uh, very steeply down to the Levisham station. So the village and Levisham are quite a distance from one another. I'm going to say it's quite a, a height as well if you're going to get off at the railway station uh, there. And uh, you say this was sort of that new church up in Levisham was built in 1884, which made this church down here redundant. So the uh, this church actually served both villages of Lockton and Levisham. Lockton's got its own church and obviously Levisham has got its Victorian church there. So it really became redundant uh, totally after that. And it's a shame really because it was lead thieves, I think in the 1960s, that stole the, uh, the lead off the roof here and it's led it to, to its further decay. Because I think people were still using it uh, right up to that period because obviously, uh, as I mentioned before, a lot of people had affinity with the older churches and didn't like the new churches that were being built. As we'll see later on in, in this talk. So you can actually walk down there and let's go around the graveyard. Just one thing to point out is that the tower is a lot later uh, and that was actually rebuilt in 1897. So saying the church up in the village is 1884, but they're still using this church down here because of the repair and rebuilding of the tower, I guess uh, 15 years later in that. But you can go down there, you can go inside, you can see they put pan tiles over the former chancel down there and that's what you can look in. But you can only look in because there's a, a, a metal iron grill gate uh, right across it. But inside there, you can see just laid around there, uh, several sort of 11th century um, fragments of, of crosses and, and of graves around here, uh, probably dating from when it was first built. And I guess if you turn around, because there's not really much to see, but there is the sort of the uh, nave that was restored again in the 19th century. But I guess everything was removed uh, technically when it came redundant, I, I guess, in the uh, 1900s. So there's really nothing to see. But it's, it's an idyllic location down there, sort of hidden from view and having to make that uh, journey down there. So let's move on now to West, South and East Yorkshire. I'm coming down to look at Harewood Church, then dropping down to Leeds, going across to Halifax because there are quite a few redundant churches down the Calder Valley. Then going down to uh, Wentworth in, in South Yorkshire and then coming across to look at three churches in uh, East Yorkshire, uh, looking at uh, Cotton Church, uh, which again is an idyllic uh, location, and that's uh, I'll explain to where that is, and uh, then ending up at uh, Barmby on the on the marsh, uh, which is at the confluence of the River Ouse and the River Derwent. So let's go to All Saints at Harewood. Um, 
because so this is uh, on just off the main road. It's at the far end of Church Lane. Uh, it's the one that's got the village hall down there. And sometimes it's they open a cafe up in it called Muddy Boots. So you can actually park down Church Lane, but there's a car park around the village hall there, which I think you might have to make a voluntary contribution to park at. Because uh, if that's full, uh, then you can also park on Bondgate further down just off the main road and walk back up here and along here. So the uh, church here is that uh, if you walk further along from the uh, from the village hall, you come onto a metal road going into the Harewood estate. That road then comes into an unmade road, which can get very muddy. It's only about a five, ten minute walk along to the church, and then you turn left up a track into the church itself. Uh, it's uh, today is owned by the uh, church's uh, conservation trust and is normally open most days during the summertime uh, but you need to check their website you can say especially uh, at the moment and uh, you can say at the uh, inside is that the present church was built around about 1410 but there have been other churches on the site before that uh, you can say one was mentioned in in the doomsday book and uh, you can say there was uh, other ones as well probably after that rebuilt in stone but the one we see today dates from 1410 and was built by uh, the daughters of William de Olbra. He was really the tenant and uh, of the uh, castle that was built there a long time before the hall uh, was built. Uh, and these were his daughters, Elizabeth and Sybil, uh, they built the church in memory of their father. And at that time, it was called Holy Cross, uh, or probably Ho Holy Rood to begin with, and then had to be changed uh, come the, uh, the dissolution of the monasteries. And uh, so uh, we see inside of that, if you go in, it's a, it's a fairly empty church, but because most people come to look at the alabaster tombs in here. Uh, and because we've got two, two side chapels, uh, one to the south is uh, to the Gascoins, because uh, they're the big family that lived here uh, until they moved uh, over to sort of uh, to the Aberford area later on. Uh, they owned uh, Parlington Hall that we've seen before on the Follies. Uh, and uh, the other one is to the Redmond family who owned the land at Harewood as well at some time. But most people come in here because there's uh, uh, three pairs of uh, tombs uh, for totaling six effigies on them. And they're most ornate uh, ones, probably in Britain as well. Alabaster tended to come from really the Nottingham area. So it was going to be a very expensive thing to have brought up here, because say the um, amount that they had here. And we see two people here. We've got the, uh, this is a tomb of Sir Richard Redman over there. He was Sheriff of Yorkshire and Speaker of the House of Commons. Wasn't born here, he was born at Levens in Westmoreland. Next to him is his wife here, Elizabeth de Olborough, and uh, she was the daughter of William de Olborough, who had the castle built at uh, Harewood, just to say, uh, not so far away, in 1366. Uh, they, uh, her and her sister, Sybil, inherited uh, the estate on the death of her only brother in 1392. Those two married in 1393. He died in 1426 and she died in 1434. So, so all these tombs in here date from between 1419 and 1510. They would have been very brightly painted. There would probably been sort of gold uh, paintwork on here uh, and, uh, of, um, and probably uh, saying because it, that's what you can't see here now because it's sort of all dropped off uh, there un unfortunately. So this is a detail at the base of uh, Sir William Gascoigne and his first wife Elizabeth Mowbray. He died in 1419, was the Chief Justice of England. His second wife, Joan Pickering, actually isn't buried here, which is rather unusual. She's buried at home on Spalding Moor, where she died in 1426. So a great church to go and visit if you haven't uh, seen inside Harewood Church, uh, yeah, go, go down there. But you need to check out the church's conservation website for the opening hours at the moment. So now let's move into the city centre of Leeds. I'm in Upper Brigate, that's the... Uh, uh, where the, the Grand Theatre is and the uh, Opera North have their base. Uh, that's on the other side of the road. This Upper Brigate is here to my right. This is behind what was Lewis's store, uh, or I think it's called, uh, I need to just check on my uh, notes here. Um, 
home sense because uh, it's had various owners, but that's who, who it uh, owns at the moment. And so we have this long path going up to because there's quite a few uh, exhibition boards now which weren't around uh, 10 years ago. And this is one of the few churches that was built uh, really uh, in this sort of uh, post Reformation period because uh, it, it's quite a rare period because uh, I think of the religious turmoil that was undertaken during in that period. So this is a consecrated 21st of September. 1634 and again belongs to the church's conservation trust so it has its opening hours i guess they've varied uh, year by year sometimes it's only open at a weekend at the moment but you need to check out that uh, anyway as it's going on it was built by uh, a former alderman or technically i guess a lord mayor of leeds called john harrison and it became redundant in 1975 so this is what you could see unfortunately uh, it was could say it was lucky to escape demolition they wanted to demolish it in the 1850s rather unusually a man who came on his uh, uh, on his horse in shining armor was sir george gilbert scott uh, not known for uh, sort of uh, uh, going back and looking to these old churches. We saw that, uh, of its rarity and said that it should be uh, kept and then was restored in 1868 by Norman Shaw, himself a famous uh, architect at the time. Unfortunately, what he did was to remove the Jacobean screens uh, on either side of the uh, uh, of, of, of the uh, of, of the naves, it's like a double nave uh, going down here. He removed those and turned them to the side and placed them against the wall, uh, which uh, fortunately, in the end of the century, is that another friend of ours came along uh, and uh, changed it back around again in 1890. Our friend from um, Helmsley, uh, Temple Moore, he came back and restored the church back to how it would have looked in the 1640s. And so we've got, really got to thank him for that. It's the most famous uh, thing to have a look at in here be, be on the screens is on this side of the nave in the stained glass window here, because here it depicts John Harrison himself giving gold in a tankard to Charles I. Charles I came down to uh, Leeds and was kept overnight in the Red Hall. That's where the shopping centre of the core is today. And I guess a later site of Schofields as well. And uh, he was staying there after being captured and being brought down to London. And Harrison went in to give him gold hidden inside a tankard. And that's what's depicted in that window there. Uh, it's a lovely stained glass window, quite small as well. Unfortunately, part of the altar stands in front of it, so you can't get that close to it. So that's a, a blown up sort of photograph. So it's just lost a bit of the detail on that as well. And like I say, unfortunately, the other way around, it's got a mesh screening on the other side. Uh, so if you go there in the morning, it casts a shadow over the uh, window as well. So probably best going about lunchtime to get a, a more a flatter effect without the, uh, uh, the screen showing through on that. So let's go over to Halifax, uh, and like I say, I've, I've done this story of the, twice, I think, recently, uh, of, of the two churches here. This is All Souls uh, up on Haley Hill. It's on the Queensby Road out of Halifax, and it's adjacent to the uh, Bankfield Museum. That was the house of Colonel Edward Ackroyd. He was the mill owner around here, and he was called Colonel because he looked after the local militia around there, so it was only an honorary title uh, that he had. And he had his mill complex opposite side of the road. Below that stands the Dean Clough, former Dean Clough carpet mill that covers five acres down there. And uh, he'd already had uh, some success uh, as, a, as a mill owner. He had a, a mill and a model mill town he built in the 1840s over at Copley, which we're going to see uh, next after going to in, into Halifax. And he built a, a church over there as well. But in fact, that pre uh, comes after all souls in Halifax. Uh, but he had intense rivalry uh, in Halifax with uh, Sir Francis uh, Crossley, the owner of Dean Clough. They, uh, uh, Crossley was a uh, congregationalist, whereas uh, Edward Ackroy was Church of England. Uh, and there was sort of animosity between the two and this intense rivalry for being mayor and for doing things around Halifax, which would probably, uh, in a way, to Halifax's benefit. So this is the church uh, that he built uh, and uh, he employed... Uh, 
Sir George Gilbert Scott uh, to do the church here and to lay out his model village on the other side of the road. So, in fact, he was sort of outdoing Sir Francis Crossley at, at, at that time by employing, uh, I guess, they probably the most well-known uh, architect in Britain at that time. And... Uh, uh, I guess it probably put Francis Crossley's nose out a bit uh, because uh, he shows really an unknown architect to build his church, but then went back and when they built the town hall when he was Lord Mayor, he chose Sir Charles Barry, uh, the uh, architect of the, the Westminster uh, down there to, 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 to come up here as well. And the other thing between them was the, uh, the to build the larger church. This stands one feet higher than the church that we'll see next down in the town centre. It's 236 feet tall. Uh, became redundant in 1979 and now in care of the Historic Churches Preservation Trust. I went to see this, I think it was uh, about a year ago, and you can actually get uh, to go inside yourself by borrowing a key from the Bankfield Museum. But in order to do that, you've got to uh, get permission from the Historic uh, Churches uh, Conservation Trust first by going through their website. And then an email is sent over to Bankfield saying that you're going to turn up at such and such a time and they will then give you the key. Uh, again, because it's very little visited, you've got to shove hard to get inside. It does, again, say this on the other one is that the door does stick. Uh, and because you really have to put your shoulder in and going not in the summer, it's absolutely freezing cold in here as well. So, and because they're quite dark at this time of the year. So I can say, if you're going to do that, I'd choose it sort of uh, April, from April to September or something like that on hopefully uh, choosing a fairly warm day uh, uh, as well. So it's in fairly poor condition. Uh, the lot of peeling plaster work inside, a lot of mess on the floor from what's being dropped uh, down on it. It's an enormous church as well, is that the uh, uh, nave itself is uh, 87 feet long. Uh, it's got some quite nice uh, sculpturing up here of some old saints in between the uh, between the pillars up there as, as well. And uh, I say the carvings here were done by Phillips of London, so probably quite an expensive uh, company to have used down there. I can say, although it's sort of 80 odd foot long, it's also 65 feet high and could seat 800 parishioners in here as well. Because say all those Victorian benches and pews are still in place. And going up to the chancel, it's got this uh, wrought iron screen. I can say if you're going in here, there's no lights at all. So you can only go during daylight hours. That's why I'm saying go on a fairly uh, in, in, in the summer when it will be a lot brighter uh, to have a look around here. It's thought to have cost around about 11,000 to be built. Uh, it's got a, 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 a rear dust here of alabaster and there's lots of marble all the way around the place. You can see some of the uh, pillars here and the uh, pulpit as well. The font itself right at the back of the church opposite the uh, entrance you come in is absolutely enormous piece of marble there as well. That's a bit of serpentine marble. So that stands up on the hillside overlooking the town of Halifax. So coming here just to get a view of the square church is I've gone up onto the uh, the hill that overlooks it. I think it's called Beacon Hill. There's a beacon right at the top and I think they had the gibbet up there as well at one time. Uh, I'm reading a book on the sort of executions at York at the, at the moment and quite often is, well, I think all the time, if you were sort of hung for a crime, you were sent back and hung on the gallows at the place uh, that you committed the crime. So I think this is why sort of uh, uh, sometimes it's called Gibbet Hill is also used. But looking down here, this is a huge tower we see that Francis Crossley built, because uh, his church being built at exactly the same time as Ackroyd's church as well. But only the tower remains. Uh, this was a, really a replacement for this here, the, the red uh, the, the square chapel, which is built of red brick, unusually the only uh, building in Halifax of brick, uh, largely because when it was built, I think it's 1777, uh, uh, is that um, this being in a stone district, is that 
brick was fairly expensive and exclusive, but obviously went over to Hull. Everyone built in brick because of its underlying nature of its soils being clay and you need to use lighter brick. But over sort of in West Yorkshire, it was a uh, sign of wealth to build in brick. Uh, and that's what we have down there. That's now the art center. Uh, unfortunately, uh, early this year due to the COVID thing, it sort of went bankrupt, but now another sort of arts organization has taken that over and it will continue with us because they've invested a lot of money in that uh, recently. Uh, but this is the uh, square church because uh, they really only, only all that can be seen is the tower and part of the nave underneath that because it's so large you can get to but can't really get close to it for a photograph. But this is the interior as it was described because it closed in 1970 and burnt down in 1971. So that's basically the chancel and most of the nave. And so that's the only little bit that stands today. It was described as here is a nave 90 feet long, so that's longer than All Souls, 45 feet wide and 45 feet high, All Souls being uh, taller than that. With a transept on each side, the eastern end of the nave 28 feet wide, two passages six foot six inches wide and flagged with stone run up to the nave. All the pews are of oak of uniform pattern with low backs and each furnished with book boards, cushions, carpet and drawer for books. The foliage on the capitals of the pillars, as well as the whole of the carvings, have been well executed by Mr. J.W. Searle of London. The pillars are of serpentine marble. This church was a lot more expensive than Old Souls. I, I don't really know why, uh, but it cost £18,000. Uh, and you could say, this could seat, it was so large, you could seat 1,240. Uh, you could say, this spire is 235 feet high, whereas Old Souls is. 236 feet high. And uh, so the architect of this was Joseph James. Now I've done my search on it and can find nobody of that name being an architect. So perhaps this is really the only example or the largest example of the work that he did uh, in the public realm. So that's the square church in Halifax. Let's move over now to uh, Colonel Edward Ackroyd's other church at Copley. Uh, if you're coming off the M62 at uh, Ainley Top, you come down to a roundabout. One side goes down to Halifax and the other side goes down to uh, Huddersfield. If you, drop down the if you drop down the Halifax Road, you go under a tunnel underneath the M62 and drop down to Elland on the bypass. The bypass uh, is a dual carriageway, goes down to single carriageway, and there's a place called Salter Hebel. There's a set of traffic lights. Salter Hebel is where the uh, uh, the uh, um, the River Calder and the Hebel nav navigation meet together. That's a canal basin down there. Uh, you turn left down there. I think it's signposted Sorby Bridge, uh, I, I guess, and probably Greetland and other places that you've never heard of. There's a little mini roundabout there, which must be the most dangerous roundabout in Britain uh, because all sorts of traffic is coming from all sorts of directions uh, done by uh, uh, um, traffic lights. But you don't know what is moving and where when you come down this uh, spur of a road. You go straight across there, Copley's a couple of miles further along, uh, there's a pub on the left hand side called the Volunteer Arms, you drop down there, goes over the canal and then bends round to come to the model village of Copley. Uh, this was largely built in the 1840s, so really prior to um, Titus Salt building salt air. So we could say this was probably one of the smaller mill villages that then sort of spread uh, around the country. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the mill has now been demolished and but the still stands here are the model houses. It's not an enormous uh, place uh, and uh, but you can drive around in a, in, a, in a couple of minutes to give you an idea of what it looked like. But the church is in a very odd location. So on the road in, carry on driving forwards and then there's a bend in the road uh, to the right and then this little footpath takes you forward. Uh, this here is a bit of a car park for uh, a rugby playing field to the left hand side. You cross over the River Calder here, so that's a pedestrian footbridge which brings you to uh, the church itself, the other side of the river. And that was the importance of that uh, because the uh, vicar at, uh, of the parish of Halifax uh, in um, in the old church in the centre of Halifax, for some reason didn't want another church in his parish. And 
the River Calder here is a div division between the parish of uh, Halifax and the parish of Greetland. And therefore, this church is technically in the parish of Greetland, standing on the west side of the uh, bank of the River Calder. So that's the whole reason why it is there. It became redundant in 1993 and again is in care of the church's conservation trust, I guess, as you can see by the board down here. Um, and I guess it's open most of the time, even probably at the moment. Uh, it was uh, built in uh, 1863 so it came after the building of uh, Edward uh, Ackroyd's uh, All Souls Church up at uh, uh, Haley Hill and uh, say the architect was W.H. Crossland probably not well known today but he was a student of George Gilbert Scott so he was over here on All Souls Church on the building of that uh, I guess when I say George Gilbert Scott did the design, I think it'd been his studio. He probably turned up a few times to have a look, but left it to his students uh, to oversee uh, the day to day building of, of that. And uh, so he was allowed to design the church down here. I guess it's not as expensive as the one up at uh, on, on Haley Hill. And this one cost £9,000 uh, to build. Uh, and he also did some of the house, later houses in the mill village around here as well. So if you go inside, uh, that's what you get uh, with the uh, apps up, up at the um, around the uh, uh, I've the word now up for it up there uh, around the altar and. Uh, it's quite nice inside of here because there are lots of, sort of design features, but a lot, a lot of them were lost, unfortunately, in the 1960s. The whole of the walls uh, had uh, murals on them. Uh, for some unknown reason, and I guess maybe due to damp or something like that, they hacked all that uh, plaster work off with the murals on the walls, taking it back to stone. So it never looked like this. Probably accounts for why it's a degree darker in here than it would have been. Um, and then usually you could the floor tiles all the way down here. They were by um, uh, Clayton and Bell, uh, which is unusual because they're well known for uh, the London studio of doing the, um, the stained glass windows. But the stained glass windows here in here are by a different company called Hardman of Birmingham. So the reasons for that, I, I don't know, maybe it was on price or something like that. So uh, that's what we get inside of there. And it's also worth looking uh, because it's best going into this church because of the uh, again the darkness of it but getting in close up to the detail of because say like here on on the pulpit uh, where we've got some decorated mosaic panels of the uh, uh, the four evangelists around there and the agnes day uh, the lamb of god there as well so this is sort of at the Halifax end of the Calder Valley uh, and you can see uh, quite a few redundant churches on this valley uh, and not just churches but like I say when I've looked at pubs as well a lot have come redundant along here as well but we're going to move up now to Hepton Stall that uh, lies directly above Hepton Bridge a mile straight up uh, you can park at the edge of a village there's a car park uh, uh, as, as you enter into it and there's various roads off it uh, you can't really park in the centre of the village because we had a trip there a few years ago uh, and including look at the uh, old St Thomas Church up here as well the other one a lot of people come from is the uh, Methodist Chapel up here uh, which is the oldest one in continuous use and still uh, partly of octagonal shape we went up there after being checked it out the week before to make sure it was open then to find it it was closed uh, unfortunately that so uh, but old St Thomas uh, uh, church is unusual is that the Victorian church of St Thomas uh, is in the same graveyard that was built in uh, 1856 uh, when this lodge became redundant and for reasons unknown but perhaps uh, on, on due to uh, cost uh, is that the old church was never taken down and because it remains in, in the condition today. It was built uh, between 1256 and uh, uh, 1260 as a chapel of ease to the parish church in Halifax. Halifax Parish was one of the biggest parishes in Britain, stretching all the way down here, all the way down to Topperdon, and again, a bit further in the other directions as well. So from Halifax to Todmorden about sort of 16 miles. And again, it stretched beyond Todmorden as well. And Todmorden was the end of the West Riding of Yorkshire at that time. 
And uh, so coming up here, the graveyard there has around 100,000 interments in it. They sort of piled graves, uh, coffins on one on top of the other. Any bones they found in sort of previously used ones will be put in the charnel house, which is a small building uh, which is next to the graveyard. Uh, so they simply turn the graves over and reuse them again. The most notable grave is one uh, to uh, David Hartley. He was the Crag Coiner. Uh, he was from Crag Vale on the other side of the valley. And what he did was basically take, took coins of the realms, took a bit off the outside of it, and then remilled the edges. Those filings of gold and silver, he then made into a new coin and passed them off as a new coinage. He was caught, uh, hung on the Naismire on Saturday, the 28th of April, 1770. Looking through that book, on, I'm reading at the moment on sort of the uh, people who hung uh, uh, in York, is that there was an awful lot of this coin clipping going on at that time. So it wasn't just him, but there were people from all over were caught uh, because uh, it was fairly soft materials. And again, a lot of people might not have known what some of these coins actually looked like when they were passed off. So this is one way of making examples of all these people. He was just one, uh, let's say, of a dozen people that were probably hung at the Nagusmire for that uh, crime. And uh, so if you can go and wander around here, and because say it's uh, grown exponentially, really, and it's sort of quite hard uh, to see uh, the, the different sort of uh, uh, dates that it was built, called St Thomas, because uh, it was dedicated to Thomas of Becket, who was murdered at Canterbury Cathedral in 1170. Still repaired today, uh, I was up here in 2008, and English Heritage uh, were having it repaired. So I can say it sort of won't fall down on top of you. And really what we have here is that the uh, aisles uh, were built successively outwards from the nave. So this is the main, so down here, that was the main nave, because that's where we got the altar up there. And then we can see another south aisle being built on here, uh, a northern sort of nave being added, and then a further nor uh, northern um, um, aisle being built here as well. And they can say built, 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 built out from here from the 1250s onwards, and these outer aisles, they date from the 15th century. So that's how it grew to... Uh, for the, for the number of parishioners, because Heptonstall was very important at that time in the Middle Ages, because it was the center of the wool textile industry in the Calder Valley. Roads came across the top from Burnley, going down into Halifax, and because they were wool merchants uh, sort of congregated on here, they had their own wool marketing hall in the village as well, because that cl only closed when the Peace Hall in Halifax, or the first Peace Hall in Halifax opened. Hepton Hall being therefore a very important hilltop village as a really marketing center for the wool textile industry. That's why they wanted such a grand church here and why it needed to be so large. And uh, unfortunately, a storm in 1847 uh, caused the tower to collapse and they decided rather than the cost of rebuilding and repairing the whole of the church is that they'll buy, uh, that they'll build a new church. And that was consecrated in 1856 and stands side by side. They say that there's only two churches which say uh, share the same uh, churchyard. Uh, this one of uh, Hepton Saul being one of them and the other being down at Westminster. But we know that's not true because when we come down to Wentworth uh, outside by Wentworth Woodhouse Hall is that there are two churches in the same yard there as well. So no doubt there are other places around that probably have two uh, churches in the same yard, one being redundant and the uh, older one. In fact, there's one in Lincolnshire I visited uh, in, in the summer on the walks are around there and there are two churches in the same yard there. Because uh, that's between, I think, between Louth and Grimsby somewhere. Uh, so there you have it. So there's a number throughout the country. Moving to the head of the Calder Valley, uh, I've chosen Todmorden because uh, there are a number of churches uh, that tell quite a, a bit of a story about why some became redundant, why some people like the older churches, and because uh, Todmorden's a brilliant case uh, on this. Uh, say at one time, the uh, it was on the border between uh, York, uh, Yorkshire and Lancashire, 
the town hall was divided because the stream that runs down through the centre of Tobberdon was a dividing line and that went under the middle of the town hall. So technically Christchurch at Tobberdon, which stands next to uh, Centre Vale Park, is on the Burnley Road. But I think sometimes since the uh, 16th, 17th century or whenever, is that Tobberdon's been wholly within the West Riding of Yorkshire and uh, remains so to this day. And uh, so the older church is called St Mary and uh, if you come up the Calder Valley where the town hall is at the centre of the road it comes to a T-junction. Turn right to go down the Burnley Road which we're looking at the church on and turn left to go down to the road that goes down to uh, Rochdale and, and Littleborough and Walsden and down that way is the other way and we'll so be looking that other way in a minute as, uh, as well. So this was built in Centre Vale Park, which is a large park, uh, which the Fielden uh, family had, and they built a mansion in that. So that was the, the Fieldens uh, were big in the cotton industry, and uh, John Fielden became an MP in the 1830s. He was anti the poor law, he was anti the corn, uh, uh, the price on corn, and therefore had a great support by his workers, not say his conditions in his factory or his pay were any better, but he seemed to stand up for sort of workers' rights and, and the poor in the area. He refused to have a workhouse in Topperdon, and in fact, uh, it wasn't built until after 20 years after he died, I think in the 1870s, when it was meant to have been built one in the 1830s. But that's by the by. This church uh, was built in 1832 at a cost of £3,941. And it was funded by the Million Act. And that was really from war repatriations that the French had to pay after 1815. And it went into a government fund to build more Church of England churches because the government, being very Church of England, uh, didn't like the rise of all the um, non-conformist chapels and that the Church of England hadn't kept pace with those. So that's one of the reasons why we ended up with so many uh, Victorian churches becoming redundant because they built too many of them, not that they knew that at the time. And so uh, this is one of the churches here. It became, because um, they was um, uh, built 1832, and that made the St Mary's Church, the older church in the centre of Tompadon, redundant. But people didn't like coming down to this modern Victorian, uh, well, I could say pre-Victorian, to this more modern church down there, and they're still so went to St Mary's and demanded services down there. So in fact, the sort of uh, Pop, the, the parishioners were split between the two churches and that St Mary's still had the right to carry out marriages and Christchurch didn't and so it was a bit of a ridiculous situation is that the sort of the um, I, I guess it was the parish of Halifax hadn't actually sort of established uh, which church was doing what and actually made one formally redundant. This became redundant in 1992 and there's a problem then of what to do with it. And eventually it was sold as a house and that's not been without its problems. And when it was last sold or came up for sale in 2017, it still hadn't been fully converted. It was on the market for £150,000 uh, with the agent saying it's going to cost at least another quarter of a million pounds to finish off what the uh, initial uh, uh, homeowner wanted to do and largely that's the problem with them is that these huge costs of doing that the huge costs of heating these places as well and the sheer size of them being a major problem and it they also come with other covenants as well uh, which people Put people off buying them so you might buy it for 150,000 uh, pounds but you probably still have the right for the church to come and it, it, you might not have the right to use the tower and certainly to visitors to the graveyard and all sorts of other things like that uh, so sometimes they're not just the one-off cost of that and the unusual thing this became redundant in 18 in 1992 but St Mary still continued on and still remains a parish church to this day in the centre of the town.
So if you come into that junction where St Mary's Church faces you, uh, because it's not a, a pretty church, not a particularly old looking church, I guess it's been rebuilt a number of times, but there's another huge church that overlooks the town. And this is the Unitarian Chapel that stands up on the hillside. So it's just off the town centre. You turn left, you go over the canal, and then there's a square there with the golden uh, ball pub in it. Uh, I'm just checking that. Uh, the golden, sorry, the Golden Lion pub in it. A road in the corner of that square takes you sharply up to the Unitarian Chapel. Because uh, there's the gatehouse lodge lower down, but you can park higher up uh, from that. I guess this was also built by the Fieldons uh, because initially when they were moved into uh, Tobbenden, there were Quakers. They lived up on the hillside in the farm and that's really where they first started off in the cotton industry as cotton traders buying it from Manchester, bringing the cotton up to here and then handing it out to be weavers. And eventually uh, having a huge mill down in the centre of Halifax, uh, in Tobbenden. In fact, several of these mills down there, one's now, uh, uh, the site of it is now a supermarket. I think it's an Asda down there as well. And then they turned to Unitarianism, uh, which was, uh, was formed in London in 1774 uh, because they believed in inclusivity, reason and social justice. So this is a Westminster architect who designed this, a John Gibson, and he built this for the, the, the sons of Honest John Field and the MP. Uh, they were uh, Joshua uh, and Samuel and uh, John uh, as well. And uh, so it's rather unusual is in front of it. It's, it's a very strange uh, building to begin with because it's got like a, 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 a porch, uh, pushed through the base of the, uh, of the of the tower there because they're very steep there's no real graveyard to it that's across the road but there are two graves in front of it these are two uh, Samuel and Joshua um, field and uh, Joshua in a strange twist of fate uh, died on his 70th birthday born on the 5th of March 1827 and died on the same date in 1897. The other brother, John, isn't buried here. For some reason, he's buried at Grimston Park, the other side of Leeds. But he lived in a castle-like structure on the other side of it called Dobroy Castle. I think it was once a, uh, a sort of Sikh temple or something like that, or a, a monastic set were up there. It's now a school out of bounds center, and that stands on the other side of the valley from that. Uh, it was uh, closed in uh, 1987, and then was then taken over by the Historic Chapels Trust in 1994. They spent a million pounds restoring it, and it's now today open for weddings and concerts. The east window here is by uh, the Belgian artist Capronier, who I've mentioned uh, before around there. So it's held for events, it's not used for Unitarian or any other services at the moment. Uh, and like I say, you'll have to check on the website to see when it's open, but it's not open at the moment until after the coronavirus has passed. So let's move from here all the way down into South Yorkshire to the village of Wentworth. I much apologise for some of these photographs because I had to grab them from other places. I'd taken photographs of these many years ago in 2015 and seem to have lost uh, the file of Wentworth, the village itself. Uh, to say it stands uh, just about four miles north of Todmorden and it's a hall which has been renovated at the moment, the sort of largest stately house in Europe. Because say the village is, is just as interesting uh, and because there's car parking I think if you park in the village car park you actually have to pay uh, for that the churches because if there are two churches because if near enough stand in the same churchyard and they would have done at one time until other sort of building took place around here is uh, dedicated to Holy Trinity it's the uh, this was built as a medieval chapel in the 13th century and it was a uh, a chapel of Eve to the parish of Hoyland, which stands about sort of three miles away. I showed you that in the follies is that there's one stood up there, thought to be sort of maybe a hunting lodge at Hoyland, uh, later became a mining town as well, as now covered in modern housing. Uh, but that was the main, uh, say, parish church round here. And say, the Wentworth didn't become a parish until its own right in 1840. The tower is slightly later bought, uh, built in either the late or early 15th century. 
the body of a church you can see uh, by this fairly poor photograph is that that was rebuilt in 1684 but all came to be disused in 1877 uh, when they opened a huge Victorian church which I'll show you a picture at, at the end and basically this came redundant they took down they they've left the south facade of what was the nave and because uh, they then demolished the rest of it uh, around there so you get the facade you get the old tower but to the right hand side you get the chancel here and the former uh, Wentworth Chapel there uh, as as well and because uh, they these uh, inside they have alabaster uh, effigies as well. It, uh, it became officially redundant in uh, 1925, the church did. Uh, I guess they, maybe it's these types of things it had become disused, but then I guess the church itself had to officially make it redundant. Uh, and at the time it was made redundant, it was actually restored at that time and restored again in 1975. And eventually took over that largely these chapels uh, and the old chancel there to the right hand side and was then taken over by the Church's Conservation Trust. It's normally only open on a Sunday uh, during the summer period, I guess from May to September or something like that, uh, but you have to check the uh, website at the moment. But you need to go into the chancel and to the Wentworth uh, thing to see the alabaster memorials to that family. And these include one to the Earl of Strathaugh, uh, uh, the uh, supporter of the Crown, who was beheaded on Tower Hill just be uh, before the Civil War. And there's another one to Charles Watson Wentworth, the second Marquis of Rockingham, because uh, he helped to negotiate an end to the American War of Independence. So that's really what you see inside of those. So only go down here on the Sunday. You can check out the website first. But within the uh, churchyard as well is this huge Victorian church that they built uh, here, but from the uh, Wentworth family uh, uh, as well. This was built, uh, also dedicated to Holy Trinity, 1875 to 1877 by the sixth Earl uh, Fitzwilliam at a cost of £25,000 and in memory of his parents. Designed by James Loughborough Pearson, uh, that we've seen his work before. Bevesner says that the family could not have spent their money more judiciously because they were glass windows in here are by Kemp and by Clayton and Bell as well. If Pearson's name rings a bell, he did the extensions to Wakefield Cathedral and he put the apse on the church at Lastingham. Closer to home here, he built the St Michael's Church in the centre of Headingley and in Horsa, St Margaret's Church up on the hillside, both in 1884. You can say this spire here is 200 feet high and it can seat 500 people. You can say when open, that was greater than the population of the parish that it covered, but it was a scale uh, to obviously to match the splendour of Wentworth Woodhouse, so that it had to be built so large, and probably why they didn't like the old parish church there. So let's now move into. East Yorkshire and uh, coming up to uh, Foxholes. Uh, this lies on the road that goes north from Driffield and joins the A64 uh, uh, down at sort of Flixton or Saxcombe, you go down Saxton Hill and it comes out just before the roundabout where you can turn left to go to Scarborough and right to go to Filey. So this is where this road comes down. Foxholes is because they part way along there. It's about six miles, I guess, from that junction. And because uh, it lies on the side of this very busy road uh, coming from uh, Driffield. Uh, this is goes on a smaller road, but drops down to Ganton again itself on the A64. It's Ganton that's got the golf club on the other side of a road. So if you're going up through Ganton, this is where that road pops out at Foxholes near to the church here. Uh, so this is the third church on the site. Uh, the Norman church first built here uh, was given to the li living of St Mary's Abbey in York. And that was pulled down in 1777. The new church was uh, consecrated in 1784, and this too was replaced with the current one that we see today of 1866 and designed by George Fowler Jones. He was a chap who did the uh, almshouses out of Aberford, his very first commission in the 1840s. 
Pesner, the architectural historian, called this church one of the ugliest in the riding. I wouldn't go that far. I think it's quite a, a, a nice and unusual uh, looking church. Uh, and again, the stained glass inside this church was by uh, Carpronia uh, as well. Became redundant in 2015, subsequently sold for two in 2016 for 110 thousand pounds with planning permission for a four bedroom house <laughs> but uh, like I say rather like that church out at uh, Topham and Christ Church it doesn't reflect that other things that have to be paid covenants uh, to the uh, church commissioners and uh, like I say access into the churchyard and other types of things that sort of do put people off from doing this type of uh, property conversion and like I say at the end of 2019 nothing had happened and I guess when I pass this year as well is that nothing's happened this year either uh, and like I say it's down to the huge costs of actually converting one of these churches. One of the saddest churches out of all this, which we probably really turned uh, redundant and disused and falling down, is the church at Cottom. Uh, and uh, Cottom isn't a village, uh, it's just an area, but at one time was a parish. It again lies on that same road coming northwards from, um, from Driffield, heading towards the A64. And at Langtoff, or just before, you can take a left hand turn on a very minor road uh, that leads over towards Sledmere House. Sledmere House from Cotton Church is about four miles and uh, it's publicly accessible. It comes on a footpath. And where this photograph's been taken from, there's a lovely dale going down the side there. So it's a, a typical Wolds Dale. And that's where the disused village was, or the, uh, the village that was uh, vacated. And that's really what you can see here, the humps and bumps of that uh, former village that then goes down the hillside into there. Uh, we know there's a church here because there's an entry for Cotton in the Doomsday Book, and there'd been a stone church built uh, up on here. It stands on the brow of the hill, so when you're coming up from the other road, it sits like on the on the on the hill. But in fact, it's at the top of one of these lovely uh, uh, chalk dales of, of the walls round here. That church we think was replaced in 1818, and the present structure that we see there was built in 1890. I don't know when it became redundant, but I guess probably in the 1930s, 1940s, uh, because there's a church further over, uh, I guess a mile and a half, two miles away at Cowlam. And indeed that's on a sort of a risk register of closing as well. Uh, and therefore, you can say that's what you see there is this church, which is falling down on a brow of a dale there. And then coming down to one of the last churches, uh, we come down to the confluence of the River Derwent with the River Ouse, right at the edge of the East Riding, and at Bombay on the Marsh. Uh, it stands on the old road that went from Hull through Howden and then across to Selby, um, crosses the, the Ouse to get to, to Selby. And in itself, there's a uh, turning uh, after Howden to Ned, Ned, Nedlington uh, and onto Barnby on the Marsh. And from that turning off the old Hull Road, it's about four miles to Barnby on the Marsh. It's a heck of a long road. And it uh, bounded at the end, because say, by the contours of the Ouse and the River Derwent. The other side of the river has got that huge uh, uh, Drax power station, because uh, that's what it's in the lurch of. And uh, like I say it's quite a large village when you get down there. It's a pub, it's got a pizza place and all sorts of other things, I guess, because anywhere else is so far to get to. And the church isn't immediately apparent. Uh, it's down a bit of a passageway past the old national school, and then you come to it sat on the uh, on the raised platform above the river uh, Ouse in this uh, circumstance. The road actually ends in a car park where you can actually go and look at the, uh, the River Derwent flood barrier. You can walk across that and look across to Drax, and it's, it's, it, it's it's unusual uh, around there uh, and it is quite interesting, worth a visit to, to come down here on its own. And uh, so the church is sort of built in various different styles. It's thought that it originated as a barn, this centre section here, dating from around 1600. Uh, the tower was built in the 18th century 
and the chancel at this end in the 19th century. So you've got a very odd uh, tower on here. You can see uh, our friend Pesner quite liked it. Uh, and I can't find this quote in the uh, thing here, but uh, uh, because of its unusual unusualness of it, and you can see it's grade two listed, uh, but in... Um, 2007, uh, the church closed down and became redundant. And that's been a problem since. In 2015, with no buyers, uh, they said the only uh, thing that they had to do was to demolish this church. Uh, this photograph was taken in 2017, I think, when I was down there. Thankfully, uh, just this last month, November 2020, it's been taken over by the Friends of Friendless Churches. And because uh, of the view just across from that uh, uh, church, that's a churchyard in front across to, uh, uh, to Dirax on the other side. Uh, I didn't know anything about the Friend of Friendless Churches. They were a charity established in 1957, and they also owned two churches near no no um, North Allerton, one north of it, Hutton Bonville, and the other south of it called Thornton Labines. I've been to neither of those. Uh, and they also own a fourth church between Brighouse and Bradford or Brigus and Bradford, I want to say, at Lightcliffe. This where Sight of Salt had his house, Crow Nest there. It's now part of the golf club. They've taken over Old St. Matthew's Church there. Uh, the whole church isn't there. There's only the tower of that church, but they're taking over that uh, to secure its future. Um, and that's what stands down there. So that's the end of our look at sort of abandoned churches, because there might be others around, but uh, not that I've, I've come across uh, on, on my travels.